This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. And good afternoon and welcome to the Sunset Safari where I've got some very exciting news and I will tell you about it in just a little bit. My name is Jamie and this afternoon Craig is on camera with me and we're coming to you live from Juma Private Game Reserve which is in the Greater Kruger National Park area of South Africa. Now because this is a live safari that means you can send through your questions on hashtag safari live on Twitter alternatively in the comments section of the YouTube chat. Now I had to get through all of that quickly I'll explain a bit more in a moment, but have a look at this because this is a very special elephant. Now, I don't think that you'll recognize her, but you'll see that she has one very tiny little baby. Now, the reason that you won't recognize her is because we're more accustomed to talking about the older female in her herd, which is the short-trunked elephant. Now, we've always suspected that the young female with her was her daughter. And look at this. She's had her first calf. Well done, girl. Oh, look at it. <laughs> Is that not just adorable? I'll explain a bit more in a little bit for our newer viewers, but this is just so special. I don't want to take away from one moment, because unfortunately I think they're going to go into some quite dense vegetation soon. Hi, little one, with your floppy ears. Yes, that's how your trunk works. Watch, Mommy, she'll show you. <laughs> oh, Mom, you're going to lead it just straight into the pile of sticks. Gently, gently. Gently, gently. Over you go. Oh, don't kick your baby in the head. Look at the way it keeps tucking its trunk into its mouth for comfort and smelling. Oh, well done, girl. Now, the short-trunked Ellie is a very special elephant. She's a very special female. She is missing the tip of her trunk. Not, it's not this female, it's one of the other females. She's missing the tip of her trunk. And she always moved about in a very, very small herd with herself, her, this, this female with this calf, and a young son and then a tiny little daughter who's now about three years old. Now this, I know that this is this female's first calf because I know that she was too young three years ago to have had one. Look, it's still fuzzy. Look at the little fuzz around its legs. Now those of you who... <laughs> Those of you who've been watching regularly will know Short Trunk and you'll know which female I'm talking about. Oh, that's it, that's it, that's a branch, yes, that's it. Oh, you're gonna you're gonna trip yourself up if you're not careful. Oh dear. Oh oh oh. What is it? Is it a little girl, or a little boy? Looks like it's a little boy. No, wait, hold on. Looks like a little girl. Oh. Either way, it's a little blessing. But if it's a female, it means that short trunks herd gets even larger. I can't see. There's a silly glare off my monitor. That's, I think it's just dust. No, it's a little female. Ladybird, you say that that is the cutest. I know, it's enough to make you forget all about the heat. Apparently it's 30... What's it again? I've forgotten, Lou. I'm so sorry. 37 degrees Fahrenheit this afternoon and 98 degrees Fahrenheit, although it's cooled down a little bit with a storm blowing in. Oh. Looks at all knees. I don't know why I find baby elephants' knees and elbows so fascinating, but I do. I think it's because they're quite flexible. Oh, I'm so happy it's a female. I know it said I said that it was wonderful if it was both ways. But the thing is, is I think Short Trunk, when she lost the tip of her trunk, actually got separated from the rest of her family. And I think she's had to start her herd all on her own. Which is what makes this so special, is that she's been able to do that. Now, although she's perfectly safe where she is, Probably at some point in her earlier life, she encountered a snare, which is a piece of metal that is set out by people looking to catch, catch antelope and bushmeat. There's the little female who belongs to Short Trunk at the back. She's now about, what, she must be two and a half now? Trying to think when Short Trunk had her baby. I, I, 
genuinely can't remember. Here comes the boy. This is the male. Surely he hasn't got that big, though. This must be a different male. He can't have got that big so soon. Hello. Good day, mister. Yes. You are very intimidating. I'm hugely intimidated. That surely can't be Short Trunk's son. He can't have got that big that quickly. Could he? I can't remember what... You know, I've been just as guilty. I've always paid more attention to Short Trunk and her, f and her females in the group. And not him. I don't think it can be him. No, it could be. It must be. He's just got... You know when you go away from a place and you expect everything to kind of stay the same? You know, all the kids must stay the same age and all of that? That's, it's a little bit how it is with animals. And I've been away for a year and a half and Hosanna's decided to grow. And I know I've been back for a while, but it still takes some getting used to. Oh, I'm so happy. I'm so, so chuffed. I'll show you Short Trunk in a little bit. She's a female standing at the back there. Ooh. Now what, Steph? I'm just gonna shuffle forward a little. Oh no, hold on. No, I'm going to shuffle forward, just so we can see short trunk. You want to know how you can tell the gender of an elephant at such a young age? It's actually quite easy if you get a good view of their genitals. So with females, if you only see their heads, let's have a look, see if we can have a look at the adult female over there with the, with the baby. Now, oh, there's short trunk. She's coming along to the left. Now, don't disappear. I'll have to show you a picture because it's actually quite a detailed conversation that we could have about the sexing of elephants. But essentially the shape of the genitals is what tells you whether it's a male or a female. During the summer months it can be very difficult. There she is. There's short trunk. It can actually be very difficult to see. So it can be, it can be something that's quite tricky. Oh, please don't have disappeared off into the clouds somewhere and I'll have to download you. I've got a picture for this exact reason. Ah, there we go. There she goes. Your little family, Short Trunk, what a good job you have done. I'm so impressed with you. Now when it's summer, it's very difficult to get a look at the genitals because often the bush is quite thick. There's the female that was born around about, I can't remember exactly when Short Trunk showed up with her. It must have been to end of 2015. So she would be about three now. Is that right? Yes. I remember we got to see her when she was just a few weeks old. It was so long ago though now, I can barely remember. So such a special elephant herd. I think apart from Fang, it's definitely one of my favorites. Oh, I'm going to seriously regret not taking a roof. All right, so if you ignore the fact that my screen is covered in, in sunscreen, so it's all sort of gloopy, that's what a female, the back of a female elephant looks like, the one on the left. It's very differently shaped to the sort of the fold, the, the V shape of the male. On the, on the right. Now that is clear from the moment the little elephant is born. The shape of the, that's the penis sheath over there and that's obviously the female part over there. So it's actually quite easy. You can look at the shape of the forehead with de fully developed ad adult elephants. I think I might even have a picture actually so that you can have a look. Let me see, I downloaded these a while ago. Oh, it's not a very good one. Now essentially the female's got quite an angular shape to her forehead and the male's got quite a smooth round feature to his head but again that only works with fully mature adult elephants because sometimes the young males also have a bit of an angle to their forehead and then of course mammary glands so the females also have well developed mammary glands unfortunately they've now moved into thick bush which was what I was expecting so I can't show you that but if you look between their front legs you will be left in no doubt as to where they or whether or not it's a male or a female with adult fully mature females. Right, it's not just myself here out this afternoon nor are we just limited to South Africa. David is out in the Maasai Mara and I'm sure he's just dying to show you his warthogs.
Hello and a very well welcome to the Mara Triangle and well done Jamie. I mean uh, I have known Jamie to be an expert of hyena but I think slowly and surely she'll soon be becoming an expert of elephants also. Now I do not have elephants here but I got something very different. We got smaller animals than elephants number one. We got that pig that's just trying to uproot any grass roots she can get and any tubers to feed on and behind her we got the wildies, the wildebeest and the zebras and this is in the Mara Triangle and my name is David and with me today is Bungay and hi Bungay very excited because the rains have started to come it feels we're getting a little bit of spitting at Uh, because we have about 29 degrees Celsius and about 84 degrees Fahrenheit. That means with the speed that's going on, temperatures will come down and it might be a good afternoon. Remember, as Demi might have said, this is a very interactive safari drive. Should you have any questions, any comments, send them through on Twitter using hashtag safari live or you can follow us on the YouTube chat stream. Now, the wildebeest, very famous for the migration, making a very big highlight in the Maasai Mara and of course in Serengeti in Tanzania. Most, if not all of them, I would say 95% of them are now officially, I think, back in Serengeti. I'm not very far from the boundary between Kenya and Tanzania or the boundary between the Mara and Serengeti, but some few that are still lagging behind. And this is what you see on your screen. Because they all tag along together. A few months ago, you'd come and look at that open area. It was all dotted with black, like black ants, or an army black ants. And there was like hundreds of thousands of the wildebeest. The grass was about four or five feet tall. They have massively brought it down, cutting it, walking on it. And this is what is left after they have gone. Now, the short train should have come from uh, October last month, but one, very late, towards the end of November, about four days, you can see the clouds in the background, is showing you, very heavy clouds. We had about one week of good rains almost every other day, and then all of a sudden they stopped. But in the meantime, we'll be watching and see we said she was not the only one, and I'm also not me and Jimmy. We also got another girl in South Africa who would like to say jumbo to all of you. Good afternoon, I am Lauren and today we are looking currently for Hosanna. He is somewhere in this area, so we're going to drive as we talk and try and see if we can find our favourite leopard. Now, it has been an incredibly hot day and the temperatures are still phenomenally hot. So we're seeking out the areas. If we were a leopard, where would we go? to get some shade and feel the coolest around here. So he was spotted this morning. So fingers crossed we can clock him somewhere and see what our boy is up to. Hmm, where are you, Hosanna? So please do interact with us, send in your questions and comments using that hashtag Safari Live. Hmm. cannot locate him at the minute, but we're going to keep trying. I don't believe he'll have gone too far. I think he'll have spent most of the day hiding from the sun. Oh, I just looked up. There is actually some cloud cover coming in. Now, isn't that wonderful for all of us? Get a break from the intense heat that we've experienced today. So that might bring some cool climate and that would be very... Oh, thank you, Louise. According to the weather, there is some rain forecasted. So yes, I think that would be a relief to all around here, to be honest. Alrighty, I'm gonna keep looking. (laughs) 
James is laughing in the back. I did actually forget to mention my cameraman is Mr. Hendry himself. What kind of accent do I have, Jacqueline? Well, I am Scottish. Yes, I am from Scotland. A lot of people find that I am Australian. I have actually even been told that I sound South African, but I am from Bonnie, Scotland. <laughs> Fabulous question. Oh, bumpy road. Okay, this would be the perfect area for a cat to seek out some shade. Another thing that surprised me on coming here is how camouflaged these cats actually are. Oh, we have an interesting question here. How far can leopards travel in a day? I'm actually not too sure, but I would guess around about maybe 10, 10 kilometers. But I'm not entirely sure about that. But in my experience spent around Hosanna, he does like to stay in the same place for a long time. Especially on hot days, he'll become much more active at nighttime when it definitely gets a little bit cooler and there's more air around for him to breathe. Okay. So there is three pairs of eyes on this vehicle at the minute. So surely we can find this boy. So while we look and we won't give up, let's go over to Jamie to see what she is looking at. Well, I'm sort of casually moving towards the Inkawumas and the Mangani males that James found this morning. So we'll get there eventually, but it's so warm, I'm not going to rush off in that direction. Especially because I just want to make sure I can see what the storm is doing before I go that far away from home. So we're just bumbling, honestly. I, I would like to go to the hyena den a little bit later today. When we went this morning, I had the new guides that we've taken on board. I went with them to the hyena den, obviously. Actually, I didn't even say anything. They chose to go there and I'm sure their choice had nothing to do with my level of favoritism. It was nice, Pretty's cubs were both out, so was the Corky's, Corky was there. I cannot believe how quickly that injury has healed, that lion injury, it's, it's quite extraordinary. Oof, I can barely hear my game drive comms. Oof. Okay, sorry. The, the way that we keep track of where all the animals are is to use a game, whoops, game drive radio. And unfortunately, Jigger's setup, Jigger's the vehicle that I'm on, Jigger's setup is, is not working terribly well. Oh, pig. No, don't run away. Aw, it's a shy pig. You know what's quite exciting is I heard from another vehicle out here that they saw their first baby warthogs. So that means that we're going to be seeing little piglets on Juma shortly. It's an exciting thing for us and it's an exciting thing for the leopards as well. I love little baby warthogs. I mentioned that it's quite hot. I think what we'll do is probably pop past Chitwood Dam at some point and just go see if there's any Ellie's having a drink or a swim. Oh, there's another piggy. She looks pregnant. Does she look pregnant? No, don't you go too. I showered and everything. Oh, she's going to stop behind the tree. Of course, she does look pregnant though. Well, that's the best view of a warthog you ever did have, isn't it? I'm going to have to take my foot off the brake. It's not Craig, it's me. I don't know why I've got out of that habit. Usually when we stop, immediately we need to take our foot off the brake so that the car doesn't do exactly what it was doing, which is creaking forward. I've got really bad at it lately. <sighs> what else? What else do we have around here since the warthogs are not being cooperative? Is that a tortoise or a rock? 
a tortoise shell. Was that always there? Was that there this morning? <laughs> I don't remember seeing that this morning and I stopped at this water hole. There it is, it looks very much like a rock. I was hoping it was a leopard tortoise on its way down for a drink, but I fear this leopard tortoise had the last drink of its life not so long ago. How very unfortunate. It's quite a big leopard tortoise as well. Oh dear. And this, by the way, this beautiful, beautiful area is called Treehouse Dam. And over there, there is a hummercorp, which I think might actually be the first hummercorp I've seen since I've been back on Juma. Well, that's good. A sign of things to come. The rain is back. There's puddles, if not water holes, and a hummercorp to complete the picture. When I was in the Mara, I think it was the most hummercorp birds I have ever seen in my entire life. There were so many of them, it was not uncommon to drive past about 40 or so on the side of the road, catching frogs and fish in the puddles. And of course we had those, that pair of hummercorp building their nest on Sheeny Bridge, which they subsequently abandoned. I know of only one hummercorp nest on Juma. It's on Nyala Road North and it's been abandoned ever since I started working here. Are you just going to sit there? Yes? Yes, you're just going to sit there. No, no, we're going into the water. I was hoping that we might see the red-chested swallows. They were here this morning collecting mud for their nests. I thought that might be quite nice to see, but of course, because I was hoping for that, they're not here. Ah, David, yes, there is actually a belief that hummercorp bring bad luck. Although in this case, I think all he's really doing or she is keeping the swallows away. So there's a belief apparently that if a hummercorp flies over your house or perhaps it lands on your house, depending upon where you hear the story, uh, it will mean that your house is going to be struck by lightning. Given that there's a storm rapidly approaching us, we'd better hope that this hummercorp doesn't come flying over the car. They are, of course, not bad luck, but there is that association with them. Now, one of the reasons, apparently, now I'm really speaking with, with second-hand information here because I obviously didn't grow up in a family that where these stories were common or, or anything like that, but my understanding of it is, or the explanation behind where its bad reputation came from is because they use they make the biggest nest of any individual bird so these massive massive structures those nests are often home to other things sometimes snorks 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 <laughs> sometimes snorks test in the top of them sometimes sn <laughs> some good grief what happened there reset hard reset sometimes storks nest on the top of those nests and you also get other small birds nesting around the side and sometimes you even find that snakes move around their nests. So what it led to was this belief because people would see a hummercorp fly in and the, the entrance to the nest is so well hidden that it's almost impossible for the stork, I mean the hummercorp to be seen as it goes in. So people believed that they were shapeshifters because they'd see a hummercorp go in and then they would see something else fly away or perhaps a snake crawl out of one of the exit holes or something like that. That apparently is where the story came from that, that hummercorps are bad luck or associated with bad luck because they can shapeshift, which obviously therefore makes them, I don't know, agents of, of sinister forces. There's a few birds that that belief is attached to. Apparently, the emerald-spotted wood dove, apparently it's very bad luck to listen to the whole call. You've got to block your ears if it's calling because it means that one of your family members will die if you listen to the whole call. Fortunately, that does not seem to be true, otherwise we'd all be in very big trouble. Look at the storm that's building above us. It actually looks less impressive now that it's stretching across the sky. 
Right, well, for our newer viewers, you might be forgiven with the speed with which we link to each other that, for thinking that we actually are shapeshifters ourselves. Off you go to Lauren, who is her own person and not a shapeshifter at all. Yes, indeed. So we haven't quite located our leopard yet, but we do have a lilac-breasted roller. One of the first birds I encountered here, and it still ranks on my top favourite. It is just a really pretty bird. It's compri comprised of about seven different beautiful colours, actually. Really unique colours, and it is just absolutely gorgeous. So you can see it's just <laughs> wobbling a little bit at the top of the tree here. And of course, these guys are famous for their acrobat or acrobatic antics in the sky. Haven't I? Oh, there was another one flying above. Interesting. There was two, but that one's flown off. And I did see one doing the acrobatics in the sky the other day. So it'd be awesome if we could capture something like that for you. <laughs> Look at them moving in the wind. Isn't that brilliant? Yes, they definitely have to be one of my favourite birds, I must say. Now, these birds eat insects. So he's obviously perching on the top of the tree just now, but they do eat insects. Good afternoon, mobile station. Can I run off here, please? Sorry, that was my radio. I'm just going to turn that down. What was that, Louise? Sorry, the game drive radio just went off in our ear. We're just turning it down. Oh, Mariko, that's interesting. What else are we hoping to show you today? But I would like to visit a water hole at some point when we get there. It's just been such a hot day. I really want to see some water and see what elephant, what animals like elephants could potentially be drinking there. And there has been a lot of lions sighted around recently. They were spotted this morning as well. So we're going to keep our eyes open for tracks and potential lion sighting. So you never know what we are going to see, but we're going to keep on our journey. We just wanted to show you that really beautiful bird and hopefully we can find these things for you and because it has been so hot the a lot of animals do seek shade and that's a little bit trickier to find them but let's see what we can do if we drive nice and slowly So while we keep looking, we are going to send you up north to David, who no longer has signal issues, thank goodness, to see what he has for you. Well, I'm very sure Lauren is capable of getting a hold of Hosanna, and I'll be very excited if she does that. Now, my plans today is or are to look for the sausages. The sausages is a pride of uh, lions that live around this area and I have a very interesting story to tell because yesterday morning I was around here and they got three cubs with them, one cub that's about two months and two cubs that are about three months old. I looked for them the whole morning, I looked for them and I never saw them. And uh, so just about to give up the first thing I saw were the two cubs, not the third one. And from where I saw them, as I approached the cubs, there was a leopard 15 meters away, like literally 15 yards from those cubs. And the first thing I saw is the leopard spin, it jumped and I saw the tail and it took off. Well, that worried me a bit because I did not know where the mothers were. And when I came, or when I found the mothers much later, after about 10 minutes of searching around, they were about one mile away. And I thought something did not look right there. Those cubs were too young to be on their own. But this happens if they had gone to look for some prey and that was the best place they left, they left the cubs. My guess was they had left the cubs, gave them instructions, stay here, don't move and come back. And the cubs may be exposed themselves. Now, the other third cub I'm talking about, it's a bit, a bit young, that's two months old, had a brother, and the brother disappeared two weeks ago. 
my guess is, or until yesterday, we have had, or I've had, so many theories, the possibilities of how that cab would have disappeared. And I was thinking predators, be it leopards, hyenas, or anything else, or other lions, maybe. But from yesterday morning, I'm trying to imagine, Tans says, wow, it could have been that particular leopard, because that leopard is very territorial. She lives along this lager that I want to point out. I want to point it out to you. And you notice on my right, I got my canvas there, because as we're talking, it is spitting, it is raining. So I have my canvas right there, just because from this side, the rain is coming this angle. Now, the lager that you see in front of that, in front of us, that bush or those trees there, that's where that leopardess live. It is a female, and she was just about 15 meters away from those three, I mean, two cubs, and that worried me a little bit. If I will not convince myself what might have happened to that one cub, I'm wanting now to believe it must have been that particular leopardess that might have eaten that one cub. Well, the other one looks pretty good. She seems to be doing very well and the mother doing a very good job. The mother is one of the sausages, a female that limps a little bit and we call her Limpy. Remember, this is a very interactive safari. Should you have any questions or any comments, please send them through. Hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or you can keep following us on a YouTube chat stream. So those are my plans today. Possibly if I can get the sausages that have eluded me this afternoon, but I'm sure they could be hiding somewhere. It has cooled off now with the rains coming. The temperatures go down and it's very typical for cats to just start waking up and moving around. Sometimes we just stop and maybe just pan the camera and see what we can see. In such a beautiful area, the plains of the Mara. I want to Bungay to show us why the Mara is pretty different from Juma, where Lauren and Jemi are in terms of vegetation. And you see the clouds that we saw earlier are getting thicker and heavier. Well, this officially now could be the beginning of the onset of the short rains. So open grassland, we've got all those dotted trees here and there. Look at that beauty. And most of those trees are the tortured trees. And from a distance with pretty good binoculars, as you can see, even, say, a lion or an elephant from a long, long way. And this, as I said, is big difference between the vegetation here and the one in Juma. Alrighty, nothing at the moment in those plains. So we're gonna keep moving on and hopefully these sausages, I'll see them. And the two cubs that I saw yesterday, hopefully I'm also going to see the third one that I did not yesterday. Well, having seen that vegetation, I'm sure Jamie might also want to show you the difference between the vegetation here and in Juma. Very different vegetation here on Juma to that, I mean, yes, to that of the Mara. Uh, some of very similar animals though, for example, the Impala. Uh, we went on at length about the fact that the Impala are that much bigger in the Mara than they are here. Partly just the sheer abundance of food. Now I'm going really slowly just in case there's a female here with a baby, but I think this is just a group of young females who are too young to breed. Uh, she's pregnant, but she's still not nearly ready to give birth. It's interesting. So, as these impala dash desperately away from us, which was relatively inevitable, I can't think why, but just everything I try and show you this afternoon seems to want to run away. Okay, at least she's standing still. Now, that is a pregnant female, but she's not nearly ready to give birth. Uh, a lot of people sort of believe that Impala, and I remember being taught this as a kid by some guide when I was on a drive many, 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 many moons ago, 
and I was taught that Impala could delay giving birth due to drought or whatever it happened to be. They could wait until the first rains. That is not how pregnancy works. When the baby's developed, it's developed. When it's time for it to be born, it is born. But what does happen is, during the first rutting season, she's quite alert. I suppose it pays to be. I don't think there's anything specific. She's just checking out every rustling bush. Now, uh, when the first rutting season happens, most of the females fall pregnant, but not all. Sometimes the mating is unsuccessful, sometimes the female is successful at evading the male's attentions, and as a result, there is a second rut about a month later where those females that did not fall pregnant during the first rut go into estrus again. And they are the ones who then fall pregnant at a later stage and give birth at a later stage, um, giving birth to what we in South Africa would term a late lamaki, a late lamb. You know the the children in a family who were born quite as quite a surprise and quite late. That's a late lamaki. Okay. Nope. Fine. Not a single animal wants to be on camera. <sighs> I'm going to go to Chitwa Dam, where at least the hippos are unlikely to go sprinting away from me. Fortunately, Lauren seems to be having more luck, or at least I hope she is. May her wildebeest stay where they are. <laughs> from one antelope to another, yes, I have had a little bit more luck. Although our little herd of wildebeest here have started moving away from us. However, we can still see them. And we don't often see wildebeest here, so that's why we have stopped to take a closer look at them. And they are also dropping babies at the moment. We have spotted lots of young impala around not impala, wildebeest. I'm getting my lines mixed with Jamie's now. Um, yeah, we have spotted some wildebeest around, yeah, giving birth and having babies. So that's really exciting news. Now they are wandering off and there has been a few wildebeest carcasses in the area, which has of course brought the lions. So they have been around in order to feed on these wildebeest. So while they have just moved away from us, perfect timing, we are going to continue on our search for something else. So wildebeest obviously do the great migration. They are far more populous in East Africa than they are here great numbers of them up in the Maasai Mara for example but not such big numbers of them down here. Impala we outcompete wildebeest in that aspect but it's still nice to spot them and say hello. Interesting question, what is my animal, favorite animal so far? I have to say it is the hyena. I didn't quite get who asked that question, it's very windy here, but yes, the hyena, I can't really explain it, has absolutely stolen my heart. I didn't expect to... Trister? I think that's who asked the question. The hyenas have absolutely stolen my heart. They are completely and utterly weird and wonderful. Way more socially complex than I ever imagined and I just think they're great. We have some lovely bird calls at the minute. I'm not sure if you are able to hear them. Shall I turn off so we can hear them? I think I know that call very well by now. Let's see if we can hear it one more time. There we go. Are you able to hear that? I hope so. Now this sound I hadn't actually heard until a few weeks ago and now we are hearing it all the time. So of course, the, oh, you can see it actually making the noise. This is the woodland kingfisher. From having none around to having so many. <laughs> it literally is the sound of summer. They are here. So you can't avoid hearing them now. They definitely make themselves heard. And of course, woodland kingfishers are a little bit different from the others and they make their nests in the trees. So this is why we always find them around these areas and not necessarily near the water holes like the other kingfishers. 
Wow, what a nice sound. I think Brent, unfortunately, got the first one on camera the other day. I think he beat James to the punch, which is unfortunate. But yes, now we're going to see them all over. It, Louise just confirmed it was Brent. I was on the back of the car that day, though, so maybe I can take some credit for that too. But here we have another one for you all to look at. Oh, James got cross, apparently. Ouch. We went from the silver cluster leaf over to the woodland kingfisher. So I think this is maybe the third one on camera. So it's not bad. It's not the first. But I have to say, this is another bird that I'm definitely ranking its way to the top of my list. Although the pygmy kingfisher might just top it. Oh, okay. Louise said this is the first one we've had calling. Excellent. Thank you, Lou. That makes me feel really good. I can't wait to tell Brent. <laughs> So sometimes it's nice to just stop the car, stop the engine, and just have a listen around to all the calls that you can hear. But I think this woodland kingfisher actually drowns out all the other calls. It's so loud. Yes, Jacqueline, it's a really pretty sound and beautiful bird. I completely agree. Although when you hear it quite early in the morning, maybe it isn't as beautiful. But yes, it is a lovely, lovely sound. Look at it. You can literally just see it going. You can see it perching there. Kingfishers actually have quite weak legs. Their legs are not so strong. So they normally just perch on the trees like that. You won't really find them walking on the ground so much. Wow, it's still calling. Oh, I believe we just heard some thunder. Oh, thunder, how ominous. So we have a bird calling and we have some thunder rolling in. I wonder what weather will come. Daniel, yes they are, they're intra-African migrants. I've just got a fly in my eye, bear with me while I take it out. Yes, so they do arrive here at the start of summer. So since I've been here, I've only recently just started to see them arrive. Of course they come for the rain. So if it is a really dry season that we're about to have ahead of us, you may find that they might leave a bit early. So we don't know whether we're gonna get a lot of rain, but hopefully we will. Although it's not looking great so far. We've only had one major bout of rain here, which came with a lot of thunder, lightning and power cuts, unfortunately. So I wonder how long they'll stay around for. So while we're gonna drive on and continue our search, we, were, we are gonna throw you right up to the Mara and see what they have over up in the Maasai Mara. Well done, Lauren, and uh, yeah, we have certain kingfishers which I'm not sure that will migrate, not that I know of any in Kenya, but we'll talk over certain rollers that will migrate, especially the Eurasian rollers, but as yet, not sure we have any kingfishers that migrate. I highly doubt, I haven't heard of any kingfishers even in Kenya that migrate. I've not been lucky to find my sausages and I'm trying to imagine there's only one place I would look for them. Of the five females, one of them is pregnant and we have been thinking she might pop any time. First up, good question. Will leopards kill? lion crabs because their territory or for food i would say for food mainly because you'll get in one territory for example in a particular area give it about uh 20 30 50 square miles you might get two different species of cats you know in the same area but leopards of course be doing the thing and lions will be doing the thing so they'll only hunt them as far as i'm concerned for food but when lions will go for leopards, that's what I would call predator competition. 
But of course, if leopards think that leopards, I mean, lions should be a concern for them in terms of uh, getting food, they'll have not have you know not have a problem to bring down the lion cubs as we are watching some elephants coming up in front. So the dynamics of cats are very interesting. So you get same territory with leopards, same territory with lions. But once in a while, you'll always see them going for each other. When other predators come in, we'll be talking about hyenas, for example. Heard of breeding herd here of Ellis. There's a very big cow in front, and most likely that's her calf. I don't know how big this one is compared to what Jamie had before. So the elephants now will be ruling the savannah until the wildebeest will come again next year. Somehow elephants and the wildebeest don't get along very well. Either they're always too loud, the wildebeest, and Ellis do not like that. Very majestic when we look at the elephants here and the elephants in South Africa. I've always thought the ones here are a little bit bigger in size and more rounded. I'd want Jimmy and Lauren to give me a feedback on the same and tell me what they think. But the colors are ideally the same. Big numbers when we were talking about to me and Jamie about the vegetation, you can see how here from a long way you can see Ellis just walking and meandering in the savannah that you can spot from a long distance. This area a few months ago was all dotted or we had like so many wildebeest look like flowers. All of them are gone and you can see the grass is not as high that these calves can easily walk through. They keep going not picking anything but chances are they're looking for particular shoot or small little plants like there on a small little tamarind mound. Tamarind mounds will always have some molds of gardens below where they are and because they'll only eat dead matter anything that grows on top of the mound is always very healthy and this mother and calf must have found themselves something nice to feed on there. The African elephant both males and females having the tusks unlike the Asian elephant where it's only the males that you'll get to have the task. Very clever mammals always making sure their calves remain either on this side or in the midst of the herd. Just making sure they are very safe. Well, we'll keep on looking for my favorite lions here. But in the meantime, I think Jamie got something different like a bird. Did I count that right? They're bobbing in the waves, I can't quite tell. Look how cute! How utterly adorable are they? Spring is most definitely here, and with it comes the baby boom of the low felt, and our, or at least one Egyptian goose pair, has had seven little goslings. And they are utterly adorable, Craig, I want one. I would never take one away from the parents, obviously, because that would be horrible. They belong in the wild with mum and dad, and mum and dad are such caring and loving parents. As we, well, I mean, you know, even the Buffalzook Egyptian goose parents have done their absolute. We saw how they saved their goslings' lives from Hosanna. Admittedly, they have not been very successful. Shame, it's so windy that the, the, the poor goslings are surfing. Look at them, oh, look at them bobbing about. Aren't they just so adorable? Well, absolutely everything wants to eat a gosling. I mean, apart from us, of course. Crocodiles, Legavon, and all sorts of things. Right, all or most species of birds at the moment are thinking about having babies or caring for babies. Uh, Lauren has found another large bird species that might be doing just that.
Yes, we do. We have found a, I seem to be on a bird and roll here, by the way. We have found a ground hornbill that is just walking off. Let's see if we can get a little bit closer. Every time. And ground horbills are not so common around here. Of course, we see the yellow build and the red build all the time. In fact, I see them a lot. The red build have taken to coming to my room and knocking on my glass so loud that I get such a fright. So I see them regularly. But ground hornbill is something different. Where did you go? It just went over here. Let's see if we can get it for you. Okay. I'm taking directions from my cameraman. Bear with me. Every time just waddles off. <laughs> I know you lost that. Let us keep going, let us keep going. It's like they know when the camera's coming on them, they're like, oh, we're just gonna hide now and make it really difficult. It's a beautiful bird, however, we really want to show it to you. And of course, ground hornbills are actually really endangered. They're on the IUCN endangered list. Have we lost it? Hmm, let's take a look using the camera and see if we can get that zoom to find it for us. Wouldn't that be cool if we found it? No such luck. I thought I was on a bird and roll for a minute here, but I think Ram Hornbow has defied me. So sorry for that disappointment. We will keep our eyes open for it. We're almost at the dam now. So while we head there, let's go back to Jamie. It happens, Lauren, no sweat. Birds, birds and live wildlife filming is a tricky one. Fortunately for us, our goose, our goose? Our geese are unlikely to go flying away. Although, I mean, everything else has run away from me this afternoon. Look how cute these little ones are. They look like they're having a nap now. All tucked up together. All right, I, I give up. I give up on this, I'm going home. Meanwhile, David has done the amazing, the astounding. He has disproved the theory that ostriches pop out of the ground fully grown. Yeah, but uh, we got something quite an issue here that well not an issue but something I've not seen for quite some time we've got ostriches and if you look carefully we have a female to the right and a male to the left and the female is upright and the male is sitting on something or she is just sitting down there but look carefully there in the grass now, you see, what do you see something moving there those are ostrich chicks that I've not seen for quite some time eh I'm not sure we still got more that are hatching out there and I do not know whether the male is keeping some warm because of the rains that have been going on but I have counted about three chicks. Bungay, how many can you see? Bungay thinks six and this is very interesting to see a male and a female with chicks and they always raise the chicks together both male and female ostrich and she will not see very far from those chicks as they keep following the mother. These are very special birds. They're the only birds that we've got in Africa that can't fly. And normally they lay their eggs in such open areas. Anytime we drive, we're always very careful. We don't drive over eggs of the ostriches. Huge, huge eggs. Some are like almost two dozen chicken eggs or like the equivalent of 20 chicken eggs with very hard shells. Lily, great comment and 
look at their age and look at their size and imagine one day they'll be the same size. To me, they look like chicken and I think they're just about a thousand times smaller. Look at that lily than their parents. Small, small, they look like little ducks like Jamie, like what Jamie had before. But one day they'll grow and get big. I was saying the ostrich eggs are very hard because they always make sure they don't get predated down by certain simonita lizards or other birds. That's one of the way to keep them safe because they are always hatched in open areas. That's the female there. And unlike many other birds where the sexual dimorphism is quite a challenge, the ostriches are in black and white, females being greyish, brownish in color, and the males being black and white in color. Some could have anything from 5 to 25 chicks, but somehow these particular chicks keep following the mother. And not sure why the male is still laying down there, whether he's still got more eggs to hatch. But what I found out here, yeah, there's one chick very close there to the male. Don't stay away from mom, from papa. I have found out when they are incubating their eggs, the females will lie or will lay on the eggs during the day and the males at night just because they tend to blend better that way. And I'm sure we have all had the proverb you're saying, burying your head in the sand. To about say those ostriches are about six inches high. I'm trying to look and estimate on my arm, and I would say they're barely a foot. I would say eight inches to ten inches tall. That is the height. And that's a very good question. Eight to ten inches tall. And they would easily get lost in that grass. Look at them. They're not even about a foot. So you can see total six there. And they said they could get anything from three, five, sometimes up to 25 chicks. And they'll always brood them together, a male and a female. And don't make any mistake to come to these uh, chicks with these ostriches here because they will come back to you very fiercely. And either they'll poke you or using their beaks or they'll kick you very badly. They've got very strong kicks and they defend their chicks aggressively. They might get predated once in a while by leopards or lions or the big eagles. But the mothers are quite a lot and they just either keep scanning the better part of the day instead of even feeding just to make sure these chicks are safe from the would-be predators. You see how she blends in very well in the grass there and the ground. So for them to, you know, incubate the eggs do the day makes a lot of sense? Kathy, good question. Are uh, ostriches territorial? Not really. Ostriches, you'll see them moving from one area to the other. So Kathy would say ostriches are not territorial. It's very difficult to see an ostrich at the same spot for a long time. Unless, of course, like these ones, they have eggs and maybe they'll be hatching in that particular area. They'll be territory for that period. Once they hatch out, the chicks are strong and able to move. Let's go look for seeds. Let's go look for grass. Let's go look for small insects and we feed. Now that's the male. He just rose up and you can see he's like almost completely black in color with the tail feathers baying little dirty white just because of the rains going on maybe she got lots of mud he got lots of mud on himself he's bending down now either to look for some seeds from the grass and some chicks to his left moving and the chicks are like you know shuffling between the mother and the father or the male and the female Cantal, good question. Do ostriches share nest? And yes, they do. I have seen different hens uh, incubating the same clutch of eggs. So I've seen two or three different hens and incubating the same clutch. And not sure if the three, each of them had eggs or it's only one that had eggs. So sometimes you might think maybe one hen of the three could have been the dominant hen and she's the one who had laid, but they do share nests. 
And also, when it comes to upbringing the young ones or the chicks, you could see two females, three females, a male and another male. But ideally, this is always the dominant female and the dominant male. Very fast birds, and I'm sure the mothers or the males will always train their chicks because the first defense for ostriches is speed. And the time they feel concerned by any would-be a predator, they take off and they fly low. They would more or less have the same speed like a cheetah. And when you corner them, before you corner them, they might kick backwards because you see the knees don't bend in the direction you think how they'd go forward, but they bend backwards. And if need be, they might turn around and they have been known to poke eyes of lions. Crossy, do you, uh, ostriches mate for life? I do not think so. I am not 100% sure, but I would highly doubt. I do not know anybody have researched on ostriches and followed them closely, like people have followed lions and uh, hyenas and cheetahs researching on them. I do not know that that has been done locally here or anywhere in Africa, but I would give an answer that I'm not very sure of, that they do not pair or mate for life. You will get one female, you know, mating uh, with a different male this time, one male with another female, and I highly doubt they mate for life. I like the Egyptian geese, like what we saw, you know, with Jamie or certain eagles, like the fish eagle, that we know they're very monogamous. This one, I highly doubt they do that. The chicks are so small, they tend even to disappear in the grass. But either way, the males will take advantage of feeding, and the female and the chicks will be learning something from them. Oh, fantastic. I feel very excited having this, seen these ostrich chicks that I've not, for, I've not seen for quite some time. But I think Jimmy got some animals living close or in water. Well, I've got animals living in the water, I've got animals living outside of the water, I've got animals flying above the water. It's all go, go, go at Chitwa Dam. Actually, it's quite quiet here for a normal afternoon at this time of day. I don't know where all the animals have gone, but they appear to have vanished. Fortunately, there are lots and lots and lots of hippopotamus in this dam. I have been trying to count them, but of course the difficulty with counting hippos is that it's quite difficult to determine where one begins and the other ends, or whatever, you know what I mean. Um, particularly when they're underwater for an extended period of time, usually around about 60 seconds or so, up to five minutes and at a maximum up to about 11. So trying to count heads becomes really very difficult when they keep bobbing up and disappearing down and often coming out at odd places. No, they are around, but I, do, I can't quite... If I had to guess, I would say there's probably close on 30 hippos in this dam. Might even be more than that. I was just saying to Craig, it's I've been here when this dam has flooded, when this water hole has flooded over the wall itself, the wall of the water hole. It's actually hard to imagine at this point. Three years of dry, dry, dry weather. When when Chitwa Dam is properly full, the water comes all the way up to where we're sitting. Uh, obviously, it's below us because we're on the top of the dam wall, but it's below us down there. It goes all the way up to the side there. And that little island is probably, it, it, the tree doesn't even, you can't even see the base of the tree, that's underwater, and you only see just that little bit of the island. Oh look, a crocodile. Let's have a look at that. Here we go. Little baby crocodile. I'm sure is desperately hoping for, oh dear, Craig, I think we're getting rained on. I did not expect this. Well, at least, you know, speaking about the dry, the dry season, at least we actually are getting a little bit of rain. Although it's going to play havoc with our plans for the afternoon. Given that I don't have my rain covers on, I think we're okay for now. Can't really tell. Apparently Taylor nicknamed this little baby crocodile Snappy. <laughs> Original. 
<laughs> Snappy, Snappy the baby crocodile, tail I miss you. I need you to come back and name the little goslings as well. You can name them after the seven dwarves or something like that. Happy, grumpy, sneezy. I'm sure they must be hoping for rain as well. What if it makes too much of a difference to them? It must do. The less space there is, the more competition there is. Do we have any idea how many baby crocodiles are at Chitwa? I suppose we don't. I suppose we've got absolutely no idea how many baby crocodiles there actually are because for every baby crocodile you see, there could be five that you don't. Apparently there were three. I'm very impressed that we were managed to, we've managed to get an accurate number. I wonder how many there are remaining. This wind, this weather. Totally unexpected. You can actually see how fast the wind is blowing just by looking at the ripples of Chitwa Dam. There's nothing here today. It's very unusual. Usually there's... Actually, there is something that I can show you. Usually this, this entire area around the dam is full of antelope. Now, we know that it's been dry, but have a look at the way in which a water hole changes the environment. Look at the grass and the desolation around the water hole itself. Now in summer, that would obviously be lush and green and there'd be plenty of grass, but what well, is summer actually? But because there's been so little water, the animals have been forced to constantly move up and down towards the water's edge. And they often feed around the water's edge. So what you find around all water holes is that there's more, not feeding damage exactly, but more feeding activity as well as hoof traffic. Uh, you know, a herd of buffalo walking up and down, 500 very large animals will have an effect on the soil. So you end up during these sort of dry months with an almost barren patch of land next to permanent water sources. All the reasons why they're very carefully placed. Craig, I think we're about to get drenched. Yeah. It's like being in the Mara. I'm trying to decide. I can see there's a lot of rain over there. I can't quite work out how far away that is. Now, the thing about these summer thunderstorms is that they tend to be quite localized, but the problem is I'm starting to hear thunder as well. And I did see a brief flash of lightning. I think I'm going to make tracks. I'm going to leave Chitwood Dam for now, start making my way a bit closer to camp, just in case the lightning does catch us unawares. Meanwhile, it's something that David will be very accustomed to experiencing out in the plains of the Mara. Oh, sorry, Jamie, but I'll tell you what, the rain pattern in Africa the last, what, 10, 10 years or so have been very erratic. We all leave the camps with not a single sign of, you know, the heavens opening or getting any storm. And we're out there and out of the blues, boom. That has happened to us many times. So, Jamie, don't worry, you better run because these ostriches are also wondering if it rains, what are they going to do with the chicks? Now, from a distance, from where you see those ostriches, if you pan to the right, uh, Bungay, you can see a huge wall of rain and I want to let Jamie know she is not alone. We are also very prepared. Very good. Exactly. Look at that. And you saw at one point I had my flaps down because it was spitting and it was getting bigger. But that one, the good news are, it's not coming to where we are. We know our pattern of the rain here. When the clouds build, we know where the rain that will hit us will come from. So we were in that particular direction and we had to dodge the rains and maybe come to these ostriches. I haven't left them. I've been hoping they'll come closer to the road so that we could see the chicks. And you can see the male there. That's that looks like a grayish tail. It should be white in color when she is clean. 
But if he has been, you know, incubating the eggs or have been like, you know, on the nest, definitely because of the little dust that you'd get on the ground, it makes it look a little dirty or grayish in color like the female. But males and females for ostriches are very different. Now, I can see two cheeks between these ostriches. And Bungay thinks there are many. We counted up to six, then lost the count. What is the final number you had, Bungay? Five? Okay, Bungay thinks f nine, I have six, but uh, I always want to count them for myself. Kimberly, will the baby ostriches survive to adulthood? And I'll tell you from my experience, half of them get predated, especially I'm talking here in the Mara, they get pred predated by cats and most of leopards and lions, and it's only half that will always mature to adulthood. The other challenge they face, Kimberly, are eagles, and I'm talking about, the, for example, the martial eagles. Martial eagles will always fly down and just come lift them up. If they're unlucky, I have seen pythons also going for them. So we've got big snakes here, like the African rock python, and they've been known also to hunt for these chicks before they mature. They become very vulnerable, and any time anything would go wrong, they run in different directions, and some towards either the female or the male, but in the process, some of them will lose their way and are brought down by these predators. Very huge eyes ostriches got, which also helps them or aids them to see distances. We've got so many farms now in the world where people are raising ostriches. I mean, uh, Kenya or South Africa is no exception. Nyan, good question. How long will they take for them to fledge and become adults? I'll give you that answer at one point on the drive today, but tentatively I'll guess is anything from six months to one year. They have fledged, they'll have wings, and they'll be, you know, almost independent. But most important, as much as they fledge and have wings, I'm sure, Nayan, you know, ostriches do not fly. I've always wondered why they have the feathers, but maybe the feathers would help them to keep a bit cool. And I was talking about people raising uh, ostriches all over the world and more so here in Kenya we have had uh, the medical world talking about ostrich meat which is very good with maybe zero or minimal cholesterol comparing to other meat that you get in the butcheries and having very solid bones and you can see the chicks walking there and not very far from the male there not sure if the male as he walks he disturbs any insect on the grass there the chicks will jump onto it and i'm saying ostriches having maybe solid bones could be one of the downsides for them not to, to be able to fly i would say solid bones could be quite heavy people have utilized or have harvested ostrich skins to make shoes belts handbags hats Generally, how do ostrich adults feed their chicks? One, once they are out, it's not very difficult for them to start feeding because they'll feed on small little pebbles, they'll feed on grass, they will feed on seeds and any small insect. They might maybe for the first few days, once they hatch out, introduce to them maybe small little insects or something like that to start feeding on. But just like the chicken eggs, you'll get the adults going to the ground and just scratching the ground and getting small little worms out and I would guess they'll always introduce them to the chicks. I do not know how many you know, worms or beetles they'll have to dig from the ground and that way they grow or they build up pretty quickly and then seeing what the parents are able to do like what you can see here they'll start feeding also on their own. So we normally say almost everything of an ostrich goes to good use. The skin I was talking about, the meat, and also uh, the bones people have made uh, jewelries with them. And maybe, of course, the, uh, the ostrich poo is used as very good manure. Well, I was talking about some of the predators that face 
the cheeks of ostriches, and I think Lauren might be having one. I am indeed sitting with one of the predators. We finally found him. Mr. Hosanna. It took a while, but we got there. We knew he was around, so it's just a case of searching and finding him. We are getting a little bit of droplets of rain on us, and those flashes that you might see are not lightning, as Louise thought. It is cameras. There is other vehicles around us. We're not alone at that sighting. But you can see the way he's heavily panting there. He is obviously hot. Now it is starting to cool down. I'm even starting to feel marginally cooler. So I imagine he is too. But you can see he's still very, very hot. And he's been sitting on top of this termite mount. Which, oh, look at that big yawn. Which is really, really common for them to sit on termite might mounds in order for them to cool down a little bit on a really hot day. So he has been in this area since this morning, so he's not traversed much around. Typical Hosanna style does tend to stay in the same area. But it's actually been about a week or so since I've seen him. Oh, do you hear that? Yes, Louise said it sounds very ominous. That was thunder. So something is definitely rolling in up ahead. <laughs> yes, Sharon, I completely agree. It is getting bigger. Even since my short time that I've been here, I see big changes in Hosanna, just in terms of him filling out a little bit more, becoming much more muscular, and if I may say, just a little bit more like a man getting a bigger dewlap and just becoming a little bit more like his father, Tingana. He's still got a little bit to go. He is only two and a bit. He'll be three in February. So he's still got a little bit of growth in him. But yes, you're totally right, Sharon. He is really changing. He doesn't, it doesn't look necessarily the most comfortable position in the world that he is sitting in. But it's obviously working for him. And we're getting a great big yawn there, so he's obviously ready to move. You can probably feel the rain. Ah, and a big stretch. Look at that. Where is he going to go? He's probably very relieved that the weather is slightly improving in terms of it's getting a lot cooler. So he has wandered out of our sight, unfortunately, but we will try and see if we can get you a little bit closer to him, keeping our eye on this huge... Can you hear that? That is the thunder. Yes, it is very ominous. So we've, we've located him again. You can see there are other vehicles. We are not alone, and he's just moved over to the other side of the roads. I think he's saying hello to the people on that vehicle. <laughs> hello, Hosanna. The rain's coming. Well, he's definitely staring intently at the people on there. He's a very curious cat. That's one thing I've definitely learned about this boy. He's very inquisitive, very incurious. <laughs> Yes, Louise. He's probably been like, take more photos of me. He loves the camera. And Tangana does also, actually. They always perform right on cue. So I wonder what he'll get up to tonight. We don't see any kills around here. So I wonder if he will begin hunting tonight. Normally, if leopards do have a kill, they tend to stay with it and stay in the same area where they have stashed it. And it is normally up a tree. It's very, very common. Oh, excuse the vehicle. It's just doing a little bit of reversing there. It is very common for leopards to hide their prey way up in the tree to keep it out of reach of the hyenas and the lions that are around. So we are going to link to Jamie, send you over there while we're going to get a little bit closer to Hosanna. I give up. 
I was trying to show you a baby in parlor, but it didn't want to be seen either. <sighs> okay, carry on. As we were, I'm afraid we're not going to the lions just because the lightning has got that much closer to us. I, th I think the storm is going to stay along the mountains. I don't think it's going to come here. But rather than take that chance, we're going to make sure that we're close enough to camp that we can run for shelter if we have to. Please stop running away from me, everything. What is it with me today? Am I giving, up, giving off bad vibes? Okay, there. I'm st Ooh, lightning. Okay, I'm staying still. I'm far away from you. There you go. It's okay. Oh, look, it's just been born. Not just just, but it's pretty recent. Looks like it might even still be a bit damp. It's only just used, learned to use its little wobbly legs. That's why it's so stumbly. Oh, no wonder they're so nervous. Okay, fair enough. Shame. All right. It's okay, Mum. Oof. Bit of a change from the start to the afternoon. 37 degrees we started. We've now dropped probably about 7 degrees. We're probably around, nah, probably less than that. Maybe about 34 now. Muggy. The humidity has increased immensely. That's good. Rain over there is also a good thing. I flew over the Blider Dam, which is... The, the Blider Dam is connected to the Blider River, which is the largest green canyon, or one of the largest green canyons in the world. And that I've never seen that dam that empty. Apparently there's seven weeks worth of water left being utilized by the various surrounding communities. It's scary just how dry it is. I've never seen the dam that empty. I've never flown that way either. These little ones are going to pop out. Thunder rumbling off in the distance. Yeah. Let's just wait patiently. She might relax a little bit. Spindly legs. It has been a baby bonanza this afternoon. I've been stopping at every single baby I can find. Uh, those of you who know me, or have known me the last few years, you know that this is what I do at this time of year. I look for baby birds and I look for baby antelope and I look for, for, for baby monkeys and it's just it, it's a time of year that goes so quickly and these joys are so fleeting that I really feel as though we should take advantage of them while we can and just in revel a little bit in the cuteness we get to see lion and leopard cubs if we're lucky pretty much all year round and hyenas too but this this particular time of year only comes around once how very profound and gives us all sorts of special moments to enjoy like tiny wobbly antelope and wildebeest ah, of course there's some sadness as well because a fair number of them oof <laughs> I'm gonna get a little damp Craig okay let's see if I move forward I think she's moved off away from us it's a new new baby and it's interesting, the Impala are far more skittish on this road than they are on the main road. Now that, that makes sense. They just, they see less cars. They're exposed to less vehicles. Uh, no, she's okay now. It's also, of course, the stormy weather. Let's just see. I know the baby's behind a stick, but let's just see. There's a squirrel alarm calling. And dwarf mongoose. Must be a, must be an eagle. Somewhere. Ah, <laughs> there must be an eagle, says Jamie, with one sitting above her head. I think as soon as I, oh, there it goes, there it goes. <laughs> Now, Barbara, as our eagle, of course it's going to fly off as well. Hopefully the baby in parlor stays. You want to know if animals are afraid of thunder? No, not, not really thunder. I mean, if they were terrified of thunder, that they would 
they would have a tough time. What they are afraid of, first of all, is the wind and the rain and the decreased visibility and the fact that they can't hear very well during a storm. That is what scares them. So they are more nervous around during a thunderstorm, but not because of the thunder. It's not, oh, you see that in the background. See if you can get a screenshot of it, I dare you. Send it through to hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Fastest finger first. I, let's see if one of you can get a lightning flash. Hashtag Safari Live on Twitter is how you can share it. So they're scared of that. Animals can also be struck by lightning, speaking of lightning. So they are wary of thunderstorms. I once watched, I've only ever seen it happen once, but it's cemented in me a feeling for life that elephants are the best weather predictors. And if you're worried about lightning, you should go sit with elephants if you're stuck outside. Oh, let's see if any of you got that one. Um, I once watched a herd of elephants. It was a cold, it was not a cold day. It was a summer's day and it was gray, flat and gray. It wasn't that a storm had blown in in the usual way. It, was, it wasn't even really raining, but it was this muggy feel to it. We were watching elephants feed in the river below us and all of a sudden, the, one of the elephants, probably, presumably one of the older females, gave this deep low rumble and in a split second the elephants just ran. They were gone and they just sprinted up the bank and in about, probably I'd say 20 seconds later, a flash of lightning hit the reeds in front of us. All the elephants were fine, they'd made it up the bank in time, but the, there was no doubt in my mind that those things were connected. They knew somehow, I don't know if they felt the build-up of electricity or... I mean, lightning... Doesn't lightning go from the ground up? They must have been able to feel something. There you go. There's another opportunity for a screenshot there. I'm not too worried for now. Lightning's still quite far. I hope having just told the story about the one random lightning strike that was totally without warning. Shall we? Did you get any? I think we shall continue. Yes. Mohammed, animals do get struck by lightning. A giraffe are the ones that take the biggest hit. Not so much here, but in more open areas. There's an area called the Free State in South Africa where giraffe didn't really naturally occur, but they've been introduced to. And it's open. It's really, really open, similar to the Mara. They, get, they often get struck by lightning there because Free State often also gets some really serious storms. So, what else? Oh, the Dacre. There was the Dacre on Safari Live not so long ago that was struck by lightning. There was... I once found a collection of 10 dead impala around a tree that had been struck by lightning. Sort of mass, mass death. But yes, it does happen. Animals do get struck by lightning. You'll notice that we're quite... Mine has Velcro, so if you were hoping for a repeat of Brent's moment with it flying into my face, it isn't going to happen. Mine's Velcroed down. Okay, I'm going to continue on searching for things to show you, probably keep edging my way closer to home. Let's go across to Lauren and see how Hassan is doing. So we caught up with Mr. Hosanna here and he is very interested in some nearby Impala. He seems to have woken up a little bit out of his sunbathing slumber and he's becoming very alert to some Impala around him just up ahead. You can see he's... oh? Can you see him listening, sniffing, looking? Now, all the while going, this is going on, there's thunder and forked lightning in the sky. He doesn't even seem to notice it or even perceive it as a danger. He's only interested in the impala up ahead. So hopefully we'll maybe get to see him moving closer. They haven't spotted him for sure. And this is probably why he's stalled. He's got to play this right in order to get them in order to make sure the impalas don't see him. 
He's got to play this game right and keep covered. And keep quiet. Now, obviously, leopards are great ambush hunters. That's what they do. They don't hunt something if it isn't in really clo close proximity to them. So he's got some distance to cover before he gets to these impala. But just look at that body language. You can see that he's really interested in something. And if it's been a hot, sticky day, which it has, he's probably, I would say, getting peckish now if he hasn't eaten all day. He's getting ready to hunt. His whole demeanour has changed from when he was on top of that termite mound. So he knows he's quite a distance away, he knows he hasn't been spotted. But you can see those shoulders are up. And he's constantly assessing what's going on. Look at those shoulder blades. Leopard shoulder blades are huge. They've got special muscles from getting them up the tree. And you can see them just sticking out there when he walks. And this isn't just a casual walk. This is a walk with intent. He's using the tree for cover there. Oh, the lightning around is crazy. I wonder what he's thinking when he sees the lightning. I can't see a baby in Pala where I am. There very well could be one. That's a really good question. Nope, I don't have any clear sighting of a baby in Pala. But there's lots of termite mounds and trees in the way, so there very well could be one. Hosanna's very close to us now. And can you see him going into that cat-like posture? He's getting lower and lower to the ground. He's moving in now. Now he's assessing the situation. Yes, this could be a potentially great moment. He's not close enough yet. Okay, there is a vehicle coming down the road which startled the Impalas a little bit. But we still got them inside. And his eyesight will be far better than mine. <laughs> oh, he's up again. He's on the move. Look at him sniffing and smelling. And again, they definitely haven't noticed him. So if you notice, he's moving from tree to tree. He's using the tree as his covers here. Look at him. The tail's up. Every time I've seen Hosanna lately, he's been very active, perfecting his hunting skills. <laughs> Kathy in Ohio. Great job on the camera work. Yes, I think this would be a great moment to share this with the wider audience right now. He's inching closer and closer to the Impala. On the water the Greater Kruger National Park, we are currently here with a young male leopard who goes by the name Hosanna, and he has got his sights set on the impala up ahead. There's a herd of impala a little bit off in the distance, and he's definitely potentially looking to go for the hunt. Now we can see these are male impalas. We're getting a better look now. You can see by the horns, that's how we know they're males. So this is most, most likely a bachelor herd. I thought there could potentially be impala lambs, but not looking likely with the boys. So you can see that he's edging closer and closer. His shoulder blades are up and all around us right now, we're on the verge of a great thunderstorm. The thunder is roaring. 
does thunder roar? No, it rumbles. The thunder is rumbling, and there's forked lightning all around. Great ambience for this sighting, but Hosanna is edging closer and closer. It's been an incredibly hot day here in South Africa. So he's probably just cooled down. The sun's going down, and he's getting ready to hunt. He's moving really close now. The Impala are getting very, very close to him. Now he's had to keep under cover. He can't expose himself or these Impalas will see him and they will alarm call. So he has to play this very, very carefully. Now my name is Lauren while we're at it but we're gonna keep our sights on Hosanna so that we don't miss a thing. Yes, this is amazing. Keep watching, I'm sure at any moment now. Hosanna's gonna make a judgment call exactly on what he's gonna do. Can you see the Impala just up ahead? He's definitely got his sights set on one. I actually think these boys have moved closer in his direction. I'm not aware of his presence, of course. Can you believe it? We just left Hosanna as he's heading away from us. And as we turned the car, we came across another leopard. This is Tandy. Can you believe it? From one leopard to another. Hey, girl. It looks like she's following him. In the direction of the Impalas as well. Yep, she's definitely following closely behind Hosanna. I wonder if he knows that she's there. But she'll definitely be following his scent. And there is a lot of impalas in that direction. Okay, we're just gonna reposition. Bear with us, we're just gonna move the car. Just gone behind the termite mount. Let's just see where she's going. Oh, she's on top of the termite man, giving us a perfect view of her. Look at that, with the rain clouds behind. Perfect viewpoint for us. Look at that. Yeah, that's Tandy the leopard on top of the termite mound. 
Like we normally find Tandi with the lumber, but at the moment she's alone. And Hassan has walked off her head. She's looking in his direction. She's smelling and she's listening. Look at the ears twitching. And can you see the flashing? That's not cameras this time, that's the lightning. She's probably waiting to see what Hosanna does. If he makes a kill with the Impala, there is a great chance she would come in and try and steal it from him. Two leopards and one sighting, that's amazing. It's like just since the weather cooled down, they both became really active. Okay, she's on the move again, just as the thunder rumbles. So we're going to try and see if we can keep up with Tandy and see if we can relocate Hosanna again. It's not easy keeping up with these leopards. Yeah, she's walking very quietly, got her body low down to the ground. Trying to keep herself inconspicuous as possible. Here we go. So Fosana's really not that far ahead. So she's obviously still on his scent trail. And they have been known to cross paths a lot. And they do regularly try to steal one another's kills. Yep, she's still following. I can't see those impalas anymore. Maybe they got scared by the thunder or maybe they got scared by Hosanna himself. Forked lightning is just striking the sky around us here. Kristen, yes, yeah, she looks very hungry. Yes, and so did Hosanna. I believe they've just spent the whole day avoiding the sun, trying to avoid overheating and being really lazy, so they're both getting hungry now. Okay, we'll try and see. In better position ourselves here. So whilst we move and we try to get a better position of these cats for you, let's go all the way up north to the Mara with David for an update. Well, you better get a nice position because uh, you need to keep those cats on the frame. And very interesting, when we started the drive, all of us, I mean, nobody had any lions or any leopards, but now hearing of Hosanna and Tandi is pretty good news. Well, I gave up on my search for the sausages, and I thought I'd head to a different direction because, as you saw, we had huge walls of rains that were coming, and I did not want to be rained on as much as our vehicles are a bit different than what Jimmy Lauren got. We'll always have our cover permanently because here, when it rains, it rains buffaloes and elephants, huge rains, so we can't take a chance. And we'll always have it there. We only have to bring down the flaps. Now, having given up looking for the sausages, I thought, I look for the part of lions that we call the Owinos on my way home. But again, you never know. When the rains are coming and the lions will know the grass will get wet, they tend to stay on the road. You know, so I'm telling Bungay, it's either lions on the road or hyenas or jackals or some sort of predator that must be on the road or even a mongoose. But what happens when it starts raining and the grass gets a bit wet, most cats and most lions will tend to come and stay on the road. You can see now we are already in infrared. Let me say I'm looking a bit different because it has gotten darker here rather fast than it is in South Africa. 
And being in Kenya, we are in East African time zone and South Africa and Central African time zone. So we are one hour ahead. It always gets darker here faster than it is or it gets in South Africa. We also get daybreaks a lot earlier by one hour than in South Africa. All what I'm smelling now is rain and nothing else. Rain from a distance. I can only see it, but no chance to get a drop where we are. So far, I would say it's so good, but either way, we have to be clever and start dodging the rain away. It's more coming from the eastern side of the eastern horizon, coming this way, but for me, I'm going to be doing north and a bit of west to keep away from the heavy rains if they'll come in this area. Very unpredictable rains, as I said earlier. It has been very difficult now for us even to plan nicely. The days, even the villages where I come from, you'll always have a small little backpack with you on the back there, and you'll have a small mini umbrella. If the rains catch you off guard, you must be prepared. Days and days come when you keep carrying your umbrella just in case it's going to rain and it does not rain. And the one day you're like, I'm tired of carrying this back backpack, I'm tired of carrying this umbrella. You leave it and you go either visiting a friend in a neighboring village or you go to town. That's the day that the rains will come heavily and heavy, heavy. So for me, I've always known the best thing to do, always carry your backpack and umbrella. Well, we'll keep searching for anybody who will be by the road now. I think either Jamie has some kind of antelope. Oof. I wouldn't want to be carrying an umbrella in this weather. That seems like it's asking for trouble. We do have an antelope. We have a waterbuck. And here what's quite amazing is just how brown and grey the bush really is. As Lou pointed out, it's quite phenomenal how their coats are blending in with the background at the moment. Which is why I'm not going to complain about the weather, even though the storm is getting closer and closer to us. I have a horrible feeling it's going to be a political thunderstorm, though. I have a feeling it's going to be lots of noise and lights, but no actual good may come of it. I don't know, I could be wrong. I could be about to be soused, but I don't think so. There we go. One of the larger antelope species that we get out here, the waterbuck. In fact, pretty much the largest. A kudu is slightly taller, but obviously not quite as bulky. We don't really see sable around here. There's a herd on Mala Mala, apparently. I wish, I wish we could show you sable live. That would be exciting. A sable antelope is about the same size as a waterbuck, but it is jet black in colour, and particularly the males. The females are actually a sort of a brownish colour. And rather than having these backwards curving horns, they've got these horns that curve forwards in this beautiful arch. It's something that I would really, really love to show you. But for now, we'll settle for the waterbuck, although they too appear to have some sort of crisis of confidence. Everything is being camera shy this, this afternoon. I don't know if it's some sort of vibe that I'm giving off or atmosphere, but I'm starting to get quite irritated. Oh, uh, apparently, oh, they, they've gone. I was about to go to the den, but that's all right. Um, Trish apparently is out and about, and she is at the hyena den. Good afternoon. We have an amazing sighting in a, a hyena, one of my favorite animals, I've got to say. I mean, I never was a big fan, or rather I didn't have enough experience with them to be a big fan. But my goodness, have they gotten my heart. And speaking of hearts, this is who we're looking at. This is heart, and this is how I know it, it is her. On her right ear, she has a notch in it that looks as if somebody had cut it with a pair of scissors in a perfect rectangle. Now, she is quite far from the den. The den is, oh, I can't say how far away, maybe two k's away. 
um, and I actually haven't seen her in a long time, so I'm quite happy to see Hart. I've seen Corky often and seen Pratika often with their cubs, but I really wanted to see Hart, and there she is. Just relaxing in the coolness of the day, finally. Isn't she wonderful? She's listening around, she can hear the lightning. Maria says, this is such a cool channel. Well, I have to agree with you, otherwise I wouldn't be working here, would I? I am Trishala, I didn't introduce myself earlier. And I think it is a super, super cool channel. That's why I love being here. And talking about favorite animals, I can't choose. It's just, it's too difficult. All of them are just incredible. But I've got to say, like I said earlier, hyenas have really changed their, my perception of them. Put it that way. And I think the more you watch, Maria, the more you'll know that it'll change yours too. Look at her, sniffing around, waiting and listening to the lighting. You know, this is actually, we, we just saw the leopards earlier with Lauren, and it is not unlike a hyena to just be lingering, not too close, but just close enough to be able to smell something, hear something, and get any scraps left over. Our Lara Moore says this thunder is crazy. It actually very much is. Um, I mean, look, even even uh, hearts looking up, going, "Is this for real?" Yes, it is. It is quite crazy, and the lightning is is quite intense as well. But let me tell you, it's, it sets quite a scene. It sets this really ominous predatory scene. You know, what are they going to do? What are the predators going to do with this with this atmosphere now? I am quite confident she is sitting here and she is waiting for whatever Hosanna or Tandi that we saw earlier may kill. That's typically what hyenas um, like to do, but not always. They'll also hunt. Um, and here in the Greater Kruger, they'll hunt up to 50% of the time. So don't believe everything you hear that they're just these filthy scavengers. No, they're highly intelligent, highly social animals. Oh, the drops are starting to come down a bit now. Doesn't seem to bother her. My goodness, can you hear that? It is starting to rain just a little, but that thunder is sure. Really, really loud and all over the place. You know, when you hear something and it sounds like you can't pick what direction it's coming from because it seems like it's coming from all over. Well, this is what the thunder sounds like at the moment. Look at those guys. And you know, the wind picked up a lot earlier and it's just died down now. And it just feels like the calm before the storm, as they say. Look at that expanse, waiting to shower us. Meanwhile, the animals go about their normal business while us humans try to scramble to the shelter. Sorry, Lou, I didn't quite catch that one. I'm so glad that everyone's happy about this thunder and lightning. Jackie says she loves hearing the rolling of the thunder. I do too. It sets such a nice atmosphere. Anyway, let us actually move on a little bit because I think the rain is coming and uh, we're going to have to get our covers on. So we are going to speed off to camp and then maybe in the time that we're gone, hopefully, beautiful heart, we'll be able to get something. Let us be off.
The rain's coming down hard. While I do that, let's link to Jamie with her rain covers already on. Isn't she a clever girl? I've got my rain covers, which is great, but I'm starting to think we might need a roof. But let's see. So far, we're okay. We're surviving, and we're at the hyena den, and they're here. Woo! Yay! Let's go see who's around and about. Don't you run away from me, otherwise I'm going home. I will take it, no, sit down. I will take it personally if you do. Corky? I'm not actually sure if it is Corky. Stop where you are. If these hyenas leave, I'm going to be so annoyed. Let's just try and get round. Let's pop into low range. Just so that we're not noisy. This morning, Tucker was here, as well as Corky. Oh, Pretty's here. Awesome. And then another male was here as well. I, I couldn't figure out who he was. I still need to work a little bit on the males of the clan. Hello, Pretty. Oh, and a cub's coming out. Awesome. They've moved back, by the way, to Philemon's cut line den. They've moved from that new one back to the old one. Here we go. Here we go. Out we come. Can you hear Corky? I mean, Pretty talking to them. There's the littlest of Pretty's cubs that she's giving a bath to. Oh, <laughs> it's so thirsty, so I'm going to wait till Mum lies down. <laughs> I've noticed. Nope, there we go, there's the begging. Now watch this, let's just watch this unfold. <coughs> so the smaller cub goes into the dominant suckling position, that's the dominant suckling position. Now here comes the bigger cub, and the bigger cub climbs on top of it. Now usually, usually hyena cubs have this sorted by this age. Usually the one that's submissive just accepts the fact that it's going to have to lie with its back. Look at this, it's so interesting. It's going to have to lie in the subordinate position, which is with its bottom facing outwards, away from its sibling, usually sort of at 90 degrees to mom or between her back legs. Now in this case, we've got a situation where the cubs just can't settle. And the smaller cub, who is noticeably smaller, won't give up its place in the dominant position. That's fascinating. It's something that we've observed with them for, for a while now. Oh, here comes Corky. Cubs had a bit of a panic there. For no real good reason. I think one of them might have got a little nip or something. Now squealing away. I've taught the trainees to absolutely adore hyena cubs. We are starting to get a little little damp back here. Craig, do you need to put the rain cover on? The camera. Okay. I mean, sorry everyone, as much as I'm really enjoying this, I think we might need to do some serious covering. Look at this. Um, we might need to do some serious covering up. It's now raining quite hard. So we, we'll try and get that done as quickly as possible. For now, for once, it is rainier in Juma than it is in the Mara, at least for this exact moment. Or perhaps it's just that David is far better prepared. Well, I said the other day, we'll start comparing the animals of Juma and the animals of the Mara Triangle, and more so the hyenas. Um, having the new discovery of the hyena den in Juma, and the existing den here in the Mara Triangle of the Northland, 
I think it would be a very good idea to start comparing the two sets of hyenas in terms of behavior and how they raise their young ones. As much as both the hyenas there and the hyenas here are the same species, the spotted hyena, and sometimes that we call, oops, crocuta crocuta. I don't think that should be uh, a big problem, but I think it'll be very exciting to see if there could be any difference in what happens there and here. Do you think that's bad on the road there? Or is it a piece of rock, sorry? There's a piece of rock there. So I thought it was a Niger. Yeah, it was an Niger. Anyhow, it has gotten dark here. And if you look carefully on the road, it's have, I've got, not on the road, on myself, my Masai Shuka on because it has rained more here where we are than where we came from. And the temperatures have got really, really low. And that would mean it has gotten cold. And this is my last layer. If it gets much colder, then it'll be a problem for me. So we haven't been lucky today. This afternoon has been rather quiet. I like Hosanna and Tani, but so long as you're out in the bush, you need one minute to make a whole difference. Or one turn you look left, or you look right, and you might spot some very interesting things. Now, the dynamics will start changing, as I said earlier, because of the weather, of having so much rain and the grass getting very wet. So I expect to see, as much as the road could be a bit muddy, I expect to see some sort of carnivores in the middle of the road. The road or the surface of the road will have the substrate that will keep the most heat before it starts getting cold. Joy, I'm sure you're talking about the clan of the hyenas and I would say the North Clan, Joy the North Clan, and I'm looking at the front there. Let's see, Bungay, what we have. Uh, another 50 meters. If we switch off my light there, it looks like a cut. Let's just see. Straight on. I saw something moving towards us. It looked like, it looked like a savo cut. Maybe, let me just go a little close and see. Yeah, it's coming. I can see the eyes. So let me just go a little closer. And now we are in infrared, so anything very far we might not be able to see. We'll try from there. We we'll can see what we got. But there's a little cut. I just saw the eyes. And definitely is out of range. Anyhow, to me it looked like a servo cut or a jacko. I'll go again a little bit closer, you never know. It'd be good to see a jacko or a servo cut in this darkness. All right, you're gonna try there and see if you're lucky. I think you can still see it on the road there. See how far the infrared can go. There's something dark there. That one there is either a jacko or a servo cut to the left of your screen. You can see the spotty eyes. It's quite a distance, very difficult to spot. One more look, and we might be lucky because once I have my lights on, I can see it very well. But because of the distance, okay, there we are. One more last try to the left of the road there, and I think now we shouldn't be able to get it. No. All right, well done, Bungay. We have done the best we could. Infrared helps us to see animals and making sure the animals don't see us themselves and we do not interfere with them. Ah, oh, it was definitely a savo cat has disappeared. No worries. All right, okay. Let me go here. And using my spotlight. Yeah, this could be a good time to start seeing cats, as I said earlier, and it could be anything. That is where it is. I can see it in my spotlight, but let's give it one more look. Try there. I think. 
See that? One which has a lot of time and mount. You don't see it, don't worry. We'll keep going. Yeah. Somehow there is a savocard basically disappearing in the grass. But well done, Bungay. Yeah, that yeah, that one, exactly. Yeah, that's a savocard there disappearing in the grass. You can see the shiny eyes. Fantastic. Well done, Bungay. It's quite a challenge from where it is. And I was talking about infrared. It helps us to, you know, just spoil the animals and we do not shine any artificial light to them. Sinak, how are you? And all is good to hear your name. And you're asking, do we have caracos in the Mara? Yes, we have caracos in the Mara. And I'm sure you know the one characteristic of caracos having tufts of hair on top of their ears. And just like the savocat, it's a question of luck. And if you're lucky, you see them. And yes, we got caracos and slightly bit bigger in size than the savocats. But they have a commonality, Sinak, of how they hunt. They tend always to see in the grass and they tend to feed on the same animals or the same prey, uh, talking of rodents, sometimes insects, frogs, or small birds and some reptiles like lizards or skinks or even snakes. So that's the one commonality they have. But one major difference, uh, Sinak, between the savocat that we just saw and the caracal is the, in terms of size, I would say the savocats have the longest leg because they need them to leap in the grass and sometimes they've been known to catch birds while in the air. So I'll have my torch back again and keep scanning. We don't pass anything either on the left and or, or the right and this area i am only smelling nothing but rain Gemma, how are you and what's the question again from Gemma lu sorry it's getting a bit windy here what is the question again from Gemma? Gemma, my apologies, I missed your question earlier and what's my favorite nocturnal animal here? I would say it would be the advac, and it would be the advac for only one reason. I can't remember the last time, uh, Gemma, I saw an advac. Very difficult to spot, but they're here. But when you see one, to me, it's always like winning a lottery. So that is my biggest, or uh, my favorite animal to see in the darkness. And more so, if you're lucky to see them digging a hole or digging to get out or smoke out termites, you see how efficient they are in digging. And then if you're lucky also to see them feeding on the termites with their long tongues, it's always very special. So I would say my favorite animal in the darkness will be the advoc. In terms of birds, Gemma, I love seeing night jaws. Night jaws are certain birds that during the day they'll be patched on top of tree branches. They will not come out and they'll come out at night. And they tend to remain on the roads like this here and they get the warmth of the road. You, you notice during the day when it's sunny and hot, there's a lot of heat hitting the ground, hitting the soil, and the substrate gets very warm. So they'll always come and stay on the road. And at times, you'll also see them just bathing, just bathing on the road. And on one of your legs, they have one like claw, but it looks like a thumb. And they always use it to groom themselves. And that makes them very special birds. They've got very large, I would say, far uh, on their mouth or at the base of the beak, rather, which they use just to fish or catch insects or flies as they move. All right, I would expect to see a pride of lions in this area. Where I came from, I call that area the such a pride. 
Anna Marie, how are you? And it is good to hear your name. Have I ever seen a pangolin in the Mara? Yes. Pangolins, Anna Marie, also tend to come out at night. But once in a while, you'll see them during the day. And Anna Marie, I tell you, I have seen maybe a maximum five in my career as a guide. Five, because they're very difficult to see. And we got like a myth here in Africa. If you see a pangolin, and especially during the day, then you have lady luck with you. And anything you have struggled to do for so very many years that has never worked out, that day it will work out. And if there's nothing you've been struggling to do for years, and you don't have any plan to do with that luck, you go for lottery and you're guaranteed of winning. I do not know. Out of the five times Anna Marie has seen the pangolin, I have not tried anything. I have not been in a situation where I was struggling to do or get anything. So, so some little antel up here. I'm not sure it's an impala or it's a redback. Bungay is going to put his IR on the left there, Bungay. See there's somewhere there behind that bush. Just hold on. Oh did it move? Too much have move one minute. Let me back up a little bit. There's something behind that bush there. Yeah, you see there. Let me give you a particular angle there. But something on the move. So they can get hold of it. It looks like an impala to me. Maybe not. Or oh, red buck, but it's kind of an antelope there. It was an impala. It's very strange to see her alone. And yes, it's an impala. Female impala. They always tend to go in small big herds. Quite an issue to see her alone at the moment. But nothing out of the ordinary. Either direction she is going, she's going to join the rest of the herd. It's always easier, easier that way, and of course, safety in numbers. Thank you, Bungay. When it rains, a lot of things change. I don't have my spotlight again to see whether I'll see another impala or more impalas. So I was saying earlier, the area I came from, I call it the Sausage Republic. And this area is an area it's always patrolled by another pride of lions that is called the Owinos. And I hear good news from South Africa and Jamie is very well covered now and he might be thinking of spotted predators somewhere. I am, I'm always thinking of some spotted predators, but we are covered with great efficiency. We've raced back to camp, we launched into action, grabbed the roof, put the roof on, and we're back again. So it wasn't that long. I felt horrible having to leave, and of course the rain has all but stopped, but that's exactly how it always goes. It happened to Craig and I the other night as well. We were following Hukumuri and we had to give up on following him right now. This is where the roof makes things tricky. And Saka, why are you always in the road? You're always, always there. Oh, sorry, everyone, we're gonna have to go all the way around because Saka is lying where we would position the vehicle to in order to be able to see. And there's absolutely nowhere else I can go that will get us a view of everyone. So just hold on to your seats. We're going round. <laughs> he always does this. His favorite place. So for those of you that don't know our hyena characters very well, Atsaka is the clan, one of the clan males. And he is very friendly with both Corky and with Pretty. I've noticed he has a very good relationship with both of them. And I have once before found that Pretty even spends her day with him. Or I've seen she spent one day with him. I don't know if that's a general. But I've seen her with him during the day, curled up next to him, sleeping off the heat of the day. So he's quite a well-liked male. The elephants have been here. Shoved over a tree. So 
but we just have to do some landscaping. There you go, they've pushed over this knob thorn right at the den. There we go, there we go. We'll actually be better off for this because we'll have a frontwards view so the roof won't get in our way, although it's about to get in our way now. Ow! Is that okay there, Craig? I know you can't really see pretty. Yeah, I'm all good. It's just a slap in the face from a branch. <laughs> Not my first today. Just one of those days, you know. Things just keep keep taking an odd turn. There we go, there's Corky <coughs> and her little one. Now, unfortunately, even though we don't have as good a view as we did have, it is better than nothing and the, the females will move around in a little bit. What I'm hoping for is once the cubs are well fed, they're going to come and say hello to us. They seem to really enjoy our vehicle. You know, what was interesting is that this morning I was in a larger vehicle and they didn't, they weren't afraid of it, but they weren't interested in coming up to say hello to us. And I don't think it's the size or the noise of it. I think it's just that they are accustomed to this, our particular vehicles from a very early age, probably sooner than other safari vehicles. And I think as a result, they've just got a much greater comfort. Just because we can see this view from here, just have a look at Corky's feet. Look at the size difference between her front foot or her front feet and her back feet. It's a massive difference. We often talk about them having sloping backs and a cross stride, but we often don't look at one of the other effects of this or, you know, the inevitable anatomical reality of the fact that their hindquarters are that much smaller than their forequarters. Look at the size difference in the paws. It's really very marked. I'm going absolutely insane. I'm sorry. There's the sound of interference coming through my earpiece but it's it sounds like the old internet connection back when we still used to use dial-up and it's coming through my earpiece and it's derailing my train of thought completely my my phone's off it's I've managed to cope through most of the drive with it but now I don't know if it's got worse because of the storm as well it also gets worse when I accelerate the vehicle weirdly going straight through my brain. So if I'm stumbling over my words or unable to formulate a sentence, that's why. Look at little, little Corky's cub. I'm starting to feel like I could download a polyphonic ringtone. Lou's taking us back into the 2000s. Or really early 2000s, late 90s and early 2000s. Look at little Corky's cub getting spots there. You can just see them starting to show through the fur. Her lower leg and towards its shoulder. Around about the three month mark we'll see spots on the shoulders at least. Ah! Mr. Public, you want to know if leopards walk on their toes like, or hyenas walk on their toes like leopards do? They do. They are what's known as digitigrade, or they have a digitigrade foot structure. What that means is essentially, while you're looking at Corky's back foot there, the bit that you might think of as the sort of the first joint, it is the first joint, that's the ankle. So if you follow her limb up to that little, it, it's exactly the same structure as any mammal. There, she's got a tibia and a fibula, her femur, her ankle, her tarsals, her, met her metatarsals, and her phalanges. But the, what is essentially in us, the tarsals and the phalanges, 
in hyenas and lions and leopards and everything with a paw is actually extended so that yes they are essentially walking on the balls of their feet and their ankle is much much further away from their toes so we have what's known as plantigrade a plantigrade foot structure so our feet are flat our heel touches the floor and our toes touch the floor but in lions leopards dogs whatever you may talk about with paws they have this sort of paws is a dangerous way of phrasing that but essentially most animals with paws have this foot structure uh, an exception to that would be something like a bear bears don't have this particular foot structure they have a plantigrade foot structure like a human the more advanced version of this foot structure is when the these various tarsals or carpals and phalanges are fused together and extraordinarily lengthened to create a hoof Oh, Pretty's up. She's dislodged her cubs off to the left there. And she's... Something gave her a bit of a fright. I don't think it's anything too serious. Hyena moms are often restless while they suckle. They're hungry. We're used to seeing our hyenas round-bellied. But in this case, they are really not. Oof. You know it's completely stopped raining. Can you believe it? All right. Well, from the soft, sneaky pads of a digitigrade animal, let's go across to an ungulate with Trishala. Yes, I do. I have an ungulate. But before we look at that, let's just have a look at these colors. How amazing is the color of the sky in contrasting with the color of the bush and the trees and then the land? I think it's a wonderful sight and you can see the lightning flashes in the background. Now these impala, it's a bit of a mixed herd and they are feeding a bit, they're grazing on the new shoots that have come out after the rains a couple days ago and hopefully there will be even more new shoots coming out after these rains Ooh. oh now if you got to screenshot that that would have been amazing <laughs> in fact hashtag safari live if you managed to get a good, a good screenshot of that i'd love to see it it's amazing how these imp these impalas are just kind of not really worried about the lightning at the moment and that's because they're in an open area it's the area called quarantine which i'm sure you guys are very familiar with and it's it's a bit more open and there's a, a lot more area for the impala to be able to sense any predators coming in fact driving around ar along here in the evenings you'll often see them all laying down here in quarantine. Huge groups of them. That's where they come to rest at night because it's nice and open and they can see any threats coming towards them. Christian says it's so dry, don't we worry about bushfires? We we don't really. We we there are, isn't really any grass to to be burnt at this point and um, I'm actually not sure when the last time one of the bad bushfires was um, yeah so we don't worry about them at least not for the moment oh, here's a nice specimen so this male we can see that he's a male because of his lovely horns is probably about two years old now we know this because his horns are protruding out of his head and they're actually slightly curved. Now, if he was a year old, they would not be quite curved yet, just a bit, starting to come in. And then if he was three, they'd be full blown, completely curved out like the, uh, the adult males that you'll see. So, and then I also know that it's December, and that's the right thing, the, um, uh, the, breathe, the birthing season, so he would have very likely been born in December. So it's, we'll say, you know what, mister, it might be your birthday. 
Yeah. They're very careful when you watch them, plucking off grass bits. Very careful. In fact, I think there may be some lambs in this group, if we can manage to spot some. I'm really excited about these lambs. I think they are the cutest things. They have these long, dangly legs. Now, I can't seem to see one yet. But I did see one earlier. I hope it comes back along. Now let's watch them for a bit more. In fact, I might actually drive along and see what else I can find. While I do that, let me send you across to Jamie, who has some beautiful hyenas. I do have our beautiful hyenas. And Corky's cub has just decided that it's had enough for now and went up to disrupt Pretty and her two cubs from their little feeding session. That older cub's got such a lovely spot pattern. Almost looks like it's got a smiley face on its right side. Never mind. Well, you could just lie down. Look at this. Look at the position that the older cub has adopted. Oh, not the older cub. Sorry, the bigger cub. I keep wanting to say it's older because it just looks so much older. I'm not even sure what you call, you know, there's the dominant and the submissive or the subordinate suckling position. I'm not even sure what the little cub's doing. Dominant. So interesting. So, so interesting that there's such a massive size difference between these two cubs. Oh, we've got a male coming to visit, I think. Uh, he's run away as soon as Corky's cub came to investigate. Lauren, you say that you have fallen in love with hyenas. That is marvellous. I'm very, very happy to hear it. I feel as though I've also managed to completely brainwash the newer guides into essentially loving them as much as we do. There we go. Little greeting ceremony. This morning, Saka was playing with the cubs so gently, just so sweet. Lauren, I'm glad that you love them. If we can at least change some perceptions about hyenas, then we've been successful. Doesn't have to be everyone. They won't. They won't be everyone's cup of tea. And if we can just convince some people that they're as interesting as they truly are. Hey, little one. Such a bad reputation. Oh, well done to those of you who got screenshots of the lightning. It's actually getting more and more dramatic by the moment. It really is. It's lighting up the sky behind us. Well, behind the sighting in front of us. Right, what trouble are you going? Oh! <laughs> I know the hyenas are awesome, but the lightning is very distracting. It's beautiful. What trouble is Corky's cub going to cause? Oh, now they've shuffled around again while I wasn't watching. Oh, you, no, you, you, no. <laughs> but he's not going to be very happy with you if you try that. I've seen Corky's cub try to suckle from Pretty before. It's never been allowed to get away from it, away with it. goading her. <laughs> Just being a little pissed. <laughs> Oops. Bit more co coordinated, but still not quite there. When they're fluffy this way, they just pick up every bit of debris. Shannon, you want to know if it's normal for hyena mums to be as patient or as this patient with their cubs? Yes, it's very much the, the case with hyena mums. They are, they're tolerant mothers and 
to the point that sometimes you see a lion or a leopard snarling at their cubs and occasionally giving them a bit of a sort of a, a not a smack, but they knock them down or they roll them over, just something to, to put them back in their place. It's very seldom that you see hyenas do that. They are very tolerant with their own cubs. They can be far less tolerant with the cubs of others. Now, Pretty and Corky are, I would say, friendly. The relationship between them is friendly, so neither of them responds aggressively to the cubs of the other. It seems to be very much a personality thing. Some female hyenas are more tolerant of others' cubs than others. Could have phrased that better, but you kind of know what I mean. So some females even have reputations as cub killers. They come in and they actually kill the cubs of other females, which is a quite a dark side of hyena nature and probably the biggest threat that a hyena cub in a den faces is the threat of another hyena female with cubs at the same den, usually high ranked. But it's not something that will happen here. It's also no reason for it to happen. This clan is so small that there's no real major competition to any of them. It's far better for them to stand united than to waste time and energy and potentially resources with, with political struggles. I don't know what Corky's cubs up to. James, yes. I've noticed that the Juma hyenas move dens more frequently than the Mara hyenas. The Mara hyenas, some of those den sites were occupied almost the entire time that I was in the Mara. North clan was at that den for right up until April of this year or May of this year. No, that's not right. Oh, somewhere around there. But either way, it was for months and months and months rather than for a couple of weeks before moving on. So yes, I find that the Mara hyenas stay in the same den a lot longer than the Juma clan ones do. And I don't know why that would be. I don't know if it's because there's more available den sites here in South Africa because of the termite mounds or if it's got something to do with the amount of rain. The Mara gets a lot more rain. Maybe there's not many non-flooded den sites at certain times of the year. I don't know. I don't, I don't really know. I've been thinking. I've been thinking and I'm open to, open to thoughts and suggestions. It's starting to get a bit confusing talking about Pretty's Cubs and Corky's Cub. It could continue for a little bit, but it is getting a bit confusing. I'm not going to suggest naming these guys now, but I have a suggestion for future that I'd like you to think about. The nice thing about the themes in the Mara is that it gives you a really nice idea of who's related to who without having to go back and look at a family tree or, or be told. So you know how in the Mara each mother is given a theme and her cubs are named along that theme. Now obviously I have in my time at Wild Earth, completely done away with the possibility of doing that with Pretty or Corky's Cubs because the their last set I, without thinking, had sort of named after the months that they were born in. So there was November, there was D1 and D2. Oh, that lightning. I, you know, it, it occurred to me that Corky's theme should be wine, actually. I've ruined it because I've, well, I haven't ruined it. I didn't know, but at the time, but my past me ruined it because now we've got previous adults from them that admittedly are no longer around as far as we know, but could turn up at any one point in time. So I was thinking maybe with June and Heart and Ribbon as well, we could create a theme for them. I don't know, I'm happy, I'm open to suggestions because Ribbon's theme is already could be colors with Ntima. So the next one could be named a different color. And we can't, we, it's getting really dark. We're gonna switch to infrared quickly just so that we can watch them. As you know, we do not shine spotlights on young cubs. We don't want to interfere with them. I was thinking that June June could be juice, 
types of juices because she's got the word juice on her side. Heart, I was kind of thinking bodily organs, but <laughs> it's really just thoughts off the top of my head. I'm not saying this is exactly what we're going to do. I just, I mean, imagine if there was a hyena cup called kidney at liver. Maybe not colon. <laughs> Matello oblongata is a bit of a mouthful for a hyena cub, Lou. <laughs> thyroid. <laughs> this is thyroid. <laughs> I know, I thought of ovary as well. It seems very appropriate for... <laughs> oh. Corky's gone and disturbed them again. As soon as she goes up to say hello to the cubs, they panic and they run into the den. And then Pretty goes running after them with her tail up. Oh, big yawn. Oh, she knew what they were saying to each other. Anyway, just my thoughts. Just my thoughts on namings. Not nothing official. Just something I've been thinking about. Okay, while we wait to see what happens with the Juma clan, David's exploring the darkness of the Mara. Let's go see if he can find something hidden in it. Well, Jimmy, I want to agree with you, but how they end up with naming these hyenas using themes of food is interesting because here we do not name the lions on or using the same theme, like on food, but we name them by where we find them like the female you see there walking on your screen. This is a member of the Ololola Pride of Lions. Ololola. And it's called Ololola because we've got an escarpment not very far from where we are now. That's called the Ololola Escarpment. I don't know if you can hear her calling. The sausages are called the Sausage Tree Pride of Lions because they love to climb particular trees here in the Mara that are called sausage trees, and I can hear her calling. Let me see. It's crossing the road now. Mm. She's calling me very softly. Mm. Very good. You can hear the roar now, and definitely looking for the rest of the pride is basically trying to communicate with the other members of the Ololola escarpment. And you remember at one point I said earlier, I'll stick to the road because chances are in the night or as darkness falls, there's always a possibility of seeing a cat. We saw the sabo cat earlier, not very clearly. Now we have seen a lioness. Now what you need to do is just to move and find out where she's going and know where the rest of the members of the parade are. So what she'll do, she'll walk by the roadside and you're going to do the same and if you're going to catch up with the rest of the parade, that will be very encouraging. We'll just very slowly drive behind her without getting so close. I'm not sure it's a youngster male, but definitely the rest are not very far because I can hear him or her calling. Uh, uh, very softly so just gonna follow her or follow him very slowly and maybe first stop right there and give her space Bungay can you see it and just want to give her space without getting into it is space can you hear her calling aha uh -huh. And chances are he's definitely going to join the rest of the Pride Lions being so social. We'll just get closer there and I'm sure the direction he or she's going is where the rest of them are. And the Olololos are like 16 lions together when they are all sitting in one area and either he was somewhere feeding and now is coming back and sooner or later, we're going to get the rest of the pride. Hopefully. Let 
Lichi, how are you? And that's a good question. What is the largest pride in the Mara? As you can see them joining each other and they're playing. It is the all of pride. And Lichi, you're very lucky because you're just about to see now the largest pride of the lions in the Mara. It's the all because every time I've counted them, they are only 16, even more strong together. And the females, youngsters, both males and, you know, sub adults. And look at those two. I think there's two boys. They're being so playful, eh? And it's just warming up. Because it has rained here considerably. It's playtime now. Strengthen your clothes, your teeth, your muscles. That's very playful of these youngsters here. And you see they don't look the normal color for lions because we're in black and white, we're in infrared. The rest of the parade, I can see for a fact, is very close here. And I'm going to stick around and just follow them slowly. Having gotten now a playmate, now the speed that he or he had before has slowed down. Because now they can play. It looks like a youngster to me, two, two young males. And definitely socializing. Grooming is very typical of lions all over the world where you see lions don't bite his tail It's not necessary. I trying to pick some scent or some information from that tail. Maybe yes Not once at night I've found these lions just by the roadside Passing maybe some message or reading something What did you see on the ground I trying to pick up trucks of the rest of the pride Maybe yes, they will do that should they lose track of the other members. And what happens when it rains? All the scent markings washed away. So you'll see the cats getting very busy at night, scent marking afresh. One must be very playful, the one on the left of the screen. I'm sure it was just like the cubs Jimmy had with the hyenas. But they may look big, but this Youngsters here could be only be a couple of months old. The lions grow very quickly. Hello. So if you're joining us now, this is the Olala Pride of Lions. And your questions, comments are very welcome. Hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Or you can keep following us on a YouTube chat stream. Now, I got two... I am missing 14. I got a job to do. Now, you lay down there, you make my life difficult because I have no place to pass. Either you call the rest and you give me an idea where the others could be, or you take us to the other 14. You remember I was saying earlier, they tend to lie on the road at night because the road could be a little warmer than the grass. Hello there. Where are the other 14? Now, as youngsters grow, I mean, I'm not surprised when they get about two years or two and a half, and the boys or males, the females may show them the door. And if that happens, then it could be a case of these two minus the 16 and not being with the bane pride. If it's time and they've got to the right age and they can hunt for themselves, they just move on and they start their own, you know, their own life. If the males then start their own coalition or join maybe an existing coalition. Well, I rest here trying to see they can look at the other 14, but I think Trish got something very different. Yes, indeed, he is very, very different. We have the tallest mammal in the world, and that is the giraffe. Now he is busy eating and he doesn't seem to care too much about the weather that's up, that's around at the moment but my goodness do I because the clouds are absolutely dark and heavy and thick it's getting the the wind is starting to pick up the lightning is incredible <laughs> Sorry guys, you were focused on the giraffe for that second, but I saw the most crazy lightning go through the sky right there. Speaking about lightning, we were actually talking about which type of animals get affected by lightning, and giraffe are one of the top ones. I mean, obviously, because of height, 
and unlike us humans they don't have home to run away to they've just got to they've just got to stick it out and he probably doesn't know what lightning is exactly maybe all he knows is heat and light coming his way but like i once heard you only get struck by lightning once don't you it is it's very ominous very thick it's almost it, it makes me feel sort of like this is this is the predator's time it's very ominous but mr giraffe doesn't seem too phased at this point like all the animals we've seen today it's starting to cool down and he is or they are eating because the heat in in this area it can become incredible um today must have been up and up to about 30 37 38 to be very honest it was it was hot now everyone's a bit more cool down but i think it's going to turn the opposite way very soon he's pulling on the leaves with his strong tongue and strong lips grabbing as much as he can i'm sure he is aware of the potential danger of the weather at the moment <laughs> rakesh says that watching this giraffe is making him hungry well rakesh i hope you have more food to eat than some leaves off the tree in your backyard <laughs> but unfortunately this is all that mr giraffe has to eat at the moment but he's quite happy with it ooh in fan would like to know where i'm from i am from durban durban is on the east coast of south africa It is a wonderfully sunny and beach city. I am a beach girl. I've always been on the beach, always grown up on the beach. And Durban is perfect. It's a tropical paradise really. And that's where I'm from. Oh, now the wind's really really picking up. Um this atmosphere is just incredible. It is really really heavy. Yeah, there's a true sense of what's going to happen. And if you can hear how oh, when the drops are starting to come again. Big boy here do, doesn't seem to care. So I'm trying to hope that this guy doesn't get struck by lightning. But in the meantime, let's go to Jamie with her hyena den and her trying to watch the lightning as well. We're also sitting watching the light show. The hyenas have settled down. Both mothers are suckling. There's a piece of our roof flapping. Sorry. That's what you're seeing in the top of your screen there. every now and again the lightning is just spectacular unfortunately timing wise we just have to get lucky now there's our hyenas settled in corky's watching the lighting show as well or the light show it's the south african version of celebrating the festive season admittedly in a slightly scarier way. Whoa! Ooh. Now I've got purple lines in front of my eyes. There is a massive flash there for a second. Yo. It's hard to it's hard to concentrate because I keep looking across at the sky and it's just so spectacular. But of course, as soon as I point it out, then they stop. They sort of it sort of stops that silly strap. Hold on. 
I can move it if we want. Let me, sorry Craig, let me reach up and see if I can just wrap that round so that we can see a little bit of the light show. Sorry, Aenas, sorry, sorry, sorry. There we go. That should help. That will help us a little bit. Oof. Still got spots in front of our eyes. There we go. Oof. It's beautiful. The wind is howling again. But as I said, oh, there you go. Very much a political storm. It's a lot of light and a lot of noise, and a lot of rumbling of thunder, but not much in the way of rain. In fact, I don't think there's going to be. I would say that this is going to blow past and with a minimum of fuss, I don't think there's gonna be much rain at all, which is a pity. Sure. red lights catching all the particles of leaves and dust as well that are blowing in this wind. I will say it's going to make sleeping tonight a great deal easier. Whoa! Craig, it's pure luck. Every, I feel as though every time we start moving back towards the hyenas it comes again. Starting to get a bit nerve-wracking, actually. Where's the sucker? It occurs to me I don't know where he is, and now all of a sudden it's got dark. I want to make sure he's not about to sneak up and put his head near my leg again. No, it's okay. We're okay. He's not here. Ow. Wind keeps blowing stuff into my eyes. are a little bit unsettled. You can't blame them. They've been ambushed at the den site before and it is, with all this wind, it must be really hard to hear something sneaking up on them. Sweet. All tucked up safe and sound underneath Mom's chin. little one there. Has it gone to bed? No. Ah. That would help. Here we go. Now I can hear Lou again. <laughs> All right. Since our Hyenas are currently quite sleepy. Well, someone's just woken up. Let's go across to David, who's found himself as some lions who are full of the joys of the evening. Well done, Jimmy. Stay with those hyenas. You did very well with the North Clan of Hyenas in the Mara Triangle in Kenya. Still following those ones. As I'm going to move forward now a little bit and follow my lions as you're going to keep your hyenas. And the Ololos have moved forward and I've been able to see two more. So I've seen four of the 16 and these youngsters have kept going and going and going. I do not know exactly where they want to go, but the other two that I saw that were fully grown females have taken a totally different direction. Now these ones are walking, stopping, and as usual, being playful, stop, play, stop, play. And I'm gonna stop right here. We don't want to interfere with the movement, and I'm sure Bungay will show us these layers. They say it's going to stop. Sorry about my head. I think the layers look more interesting than my head there. My apologies. 
and these two are quite playful. I do not think where they're going is where the rest of the pride is, because the other two females I saw that were fully grown were right behind us, like six o'clock. If you assume these two chaps are going twelve o'clock, and they must be very close to each other, they continued playing together. They stop. They have sent marked once, and as I said, once it rains, what happens? It's a lot of recent marking because they know the rains have washed everything. I'm going to follow them again one more time. I really don't want to interfere with their behavior. I don't want them to do what they're not meant to, be, to do because of my light. So I don't know what they're looking for there. I'll switch off my spotlight there and have a closer look on these two youngsters here. And for those who might be joining us now, the two belong to the Olololo Pride of Lions and Olololo have been named after the Olololo Escarpment. What did you smell there? What are you picking up? So they always sometimes dig their mouth or noses on the ground. You can see them smiling or are they following the scent of the other members of the Pride? It's possible and that will always help to track footsteps that might have been taken by the other members. You have to be sure. Do you want to smell that? Put it right to the Jacobson's organ to know what you picked up there and digest it. You can very faintly and softly hear it calling. Of course, ooh, ooh. And definitely they're calling the others. Why they have been so separated? I have no idea. And Lou in the phone control says she can also hear them calling. At this age I still want to believe it should be together with the rest of the pride and not on their own. Very majestic. They tend to follow their road. It's safer, they can see themselves, they know where they're going. What did you see there? Well, as we wait to find out what these two youngsters have seen, I think Jimmy's hyenas are up and about. They are up and about, and it looks as though Pretty and Corky are psyching each other up for a trip off to find themselves some food. It's exactly, it is something that they have in common with the hyenas of the Mara. It's exactly how they got going away from the den site as well. One would get up and go and sniff something and then the other would respond with their tails bristled. Not an aggression at each other, but just in a sort of display of, I guess you could call it excitement. I don't think it's, excitement is a good reflection of exactly what it is they, they're feeling. It's a sort of preparation for the night ahead. Now this sort of weather is ideal hunting weather for hyenas. They revel in the chaos and the panic that it causes. Since they're not ambush predators, they need to wait for an animal to make a mistake in some way. They're not naturally quiet creatures when it comes to sneaking up on something. So whether they scavenge something tonight or whether they go off hunting will be a secret they only they know because they would be next to impossible to follow through the bush at night. Definitely, definitely not in this weather. I'd love to be able to, but I just don't think that it is physically possible to be able to follow them in the same way that we did in the Mara. We'd find ourselves in serious trouble very quickly and stranded somewhere in the middle of a block. Walkie standing over pretty. It also took the Mara hyenas this long to get going as well. All oh, the cubs don't want them to leave yet. Not quite ready. Coming to say hello to Pretty. Well, has actually been a really lovely sunset safari. Lauren had two leopards. Trishala had a hyena. David just had a plethora of things in the Mara. We've had our hyenas at the hyena den, even if everything else ran away from us. 
Right, on that note, it is time for us to bid you all farewell and a big thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure having your company on board with us and your questions and your comments. We'll see you tomorrow for the Sunrise Safari. Until then, enjoy yourselves wherever you are.